had the great pleasure of knowing by telephone and by letters Pembroke Jones' granddaughter. And over the years, especially after the book came out in 2001, I've learned many other things. Mrs. Jones, of course, had the house. And she had had that house, like we said, from 1884 on, and it went through many transformations and it became 39 rooms at one point. So Mr. Jones had had enough, I think, of maybe the cultivation and, and all the cultivated flowers there too, maybe, because he purchased that land through his cousin, Thomas Wright, and they kept adding and adding and adding till they had 2,200 acres. But there was never, that we know of, one cultivated blossom at that part of the Jones estate. And they were, they were hers and his. That was all his. Pembroke Jones was going to use sort of a Sears and Roebuck catalog house as a hunting lodge. And his friend, Henry Walter, said no and got J. Stuart Barney, a great architect, to, to build, to design the Italianate sort of palace that was there. The lodge was used for parties occasionally, but the lodge was mostly a guy's place. Um, it, it was where they hung out and uh, because Mr. Walters was in charge of that place, we don't know hardly anything about who went there. We know a movie was filmed there, the movie people stayed there, that Caruso was scheduled to go there, that various high-ranking Italian officials visited there rather often. But there's not much else we know because Henry Walters was one of the quietest, most reticent people ever. and. Mrs. Jones and Mr. Jones being extroverts and very natural, there were people that served fried chicken in Newport. Um, the Joneses at Airlie were not that way. If she gave a big party, she would call her friend Louis T. Moore, the great historian and the Chamber of Commerce director, and say, hey, guess what? My friend Willie Vanderbilt is coming to town. Will you go meet Willie at the dock in Southport? Because his yacht couldn't come into Wilmington. It was so big and bring him through town and bring him down here. Well, knowing that Mr. Moore was going to call the Star News and Mr. Moore was going to tell them it was coming. So we do have a record, a spotty record of who came to Airlie. But anyway, the lodge was a much secret or more secret place. It was, um, it was done in, in dark walnut and it had secret doors that you would touch something and all of a sudden the bookcase turns around and you're walking into a lavish bedroom. Or there was a secret passageway from the water, the sound, that came all the way up into the house because of prohibition and all those things that were going on. And that's how they got the liquor in the house. They didn't have oyster roast at night. They had oyster roast in the daytime. And it was very simple. They had Johnny cakes, they had oysters, and they had um, usually uh, like a lemon, lemon tart or something citrus. And that's what it was. The Temple of Love, of course, used to have four ponds. It had a great, great giant circle around it. And there were four ponds, like pieces of a pie and they had live fish in there so that the guests could go and the fort fish captive, but they could go and they could catch a fish for their dinner and um, that sort of thing. And it was just a beautiful spot. It was designed by John Russell Pope, who married the Jones's daughter, Sadie. The most famous party at Landfall was the tree party. And they took the live oaks that at that time there were so many and they just would follow, you know, the ground sometimes seeking sun. And, they took those and with the help of um, Julius Evans, Mitty Evans' husband, and several other people, they built platforms and they had um, violinists, they had an orchestra up in the platforms and the trees, and all the guests went up nicely situated ladders that were made uh, that they would not stumble, and they had all their, their meal and their dessert and their drinks in the trees, which is kind of neat. And a lot of people think that happened at Early, but it did not. It happened at Landfall.